These are just little clips from uh, songs we sung for Father and a few weeks before he went home. And also little synopsis from the funeral service. So I hope you'll enjoy whatever is on this little MP3 for whatever it is. Enjoy and have your wonderful memories. God bless you as we share with you what's on the file. Blessings. growing up pretty close to 60 years and I have known him way back, way back. For the past 25 years, he never ceased to tell and remind me that he worked with and worked for my father when he was a young man. My father was about somewhere maybe 20 years older than he was. And how well my father treated him. One of the ironies though, not at the same level, is that 
In my youthful days, I worked for him, just as boys running around while he was building his house, going to the river carrying sand, so I could get to buy maybe a couple of I could only imagine what that would have been that I was working for back then, but to go by the shop out the street and buy maybe a bun and cheese or something. Many years later, I went back to the same house that I carried son as a little boy to do mason work. And that same house when I grew up. And still later, as a young man who felt I was getting mature and ready to take on manhood, I went back to the same house that I carried sand to build, that I did mason work on, and I sat in his living room, and I asked his first daughter if she would marry me. Unhesitantly, she said yes. And in only a few months, she was my wife. And that has been a long time now. 43 years and counting. Some people didn't know, and others may forget, that Mr. Murphy was an exceptional whistler. He was good at whistling. He and one of my uncles are the best whistlers that I have ever heard. They let me know that whistling was not just foo foo foo. <laughs> whistling can have styles and depth and curves and slurs. And I became a good whistler myself. Won't try it today. <laughs> a number of guys in Salisbury Plain, Parks Road, and beyond had big bikes. But he was the first in our neck of the woods to ride a big bike in our community. Some people didn't know this, but the first bike he had was an older BSA. Some of you never heard the word BSA. But he had a used BSA. And because he's a man of ambition, as you've heard, he was so ambitious, he was always looking to do better. One day, I was out at Cavaliers, and I heard this heavy, healthy, brand new 650 Triumph rolling in and who was sitting on it? Mr. Murphy. What's, I wasn't going to shot his daughter yet. I was still in my high teens, but I was absolutely impressed, intrigued, and fell in love with the bike. The next thing was my confidence in my own ability that I could ride that bike if given the opportunity. And because I knew him well and he knew me well, I thought he would be sympathetic, <laughs> empathetic, and give the guy a shot. He was cool, but let me say, I had the audacity and the bravery to implicitly suggest my desire for a ride. He was cool, calm, and collected, but he didn't think it was a good idea. He found a nice way to talk me out of it. Good man. Love that man. When we migrated, he was so proud of our progress in marriage, family, and ministry. He gave me a guitar and a little home playing amplifier. He never ceased to tell us how much he loves us and how proud he was of us and how we carried ourselves. He never called me anything but Brother Becky. That's my name, Brother Becky. One special amplifier he had, he wanted me to take to a local church. And every time I talk to him, every time I come down, he asked me when I'm going to take that big one to my local church because he knew I was pastoring. We had, we had a few things in common. We love guitar. We love music. And we love to have tools to do whatever we want to do. I never come to Florida and didn't find something to do for him that I think was necessary and important. 
As his health became an issue, I found it even more pleasure to do things that would make him feel happy. I come tired and I would just work, 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 work for him because I knew he wants to work and he would work if he was able to. And I do it. Of the many things he has said to me over the years, one thing he said that I will never forget as long as my cognitive ability and my faculties remain intact. Just over a year ago, as his health took a downward spiral, my wife called him one night and spoke to them, and he always asked for Brother Becky. That night when I spoke to him, before we concluded the conversation, he said to me in a low voice, he said, Paul gone, but you are still here. I wondered if I heard what he said clearly. I thought I heard what I wondered because it was kind of strange to hear him say that to me. I asked, why do you say Pops? Because I call him Pops. That's all I call him, Pops, Pops, Pops. Maybe occasionally I say Papa, but I say Pops. And he repeated the same thing three times over. He said, Paul is gone, but you are still here. That hit me like a ton of bricks. There was a deep hidden meaning to that as I suppose. And I'm still grappling with what he really meant deep down. It sounded to me as if he was saying, I have two sons and one is gone. You are the other. I know I'm just his son-in-law, but I think I came into his life early enough to gain fatherhood and sonship relationship. And he treated me like that for all of the years. And I wouldn't go into some of the deep stories. Really, there's so much that we could talk about. When we came down here in Florida in July, one day we gathered in his room and we decided to sing some of his favorite songs because we knew that he was really ill. And we consciously knew it wouldn't be that long before he would be gone home to be with the Lord. My wife had spoken to him and had recorded and had taken, so I took note of some of his favorite songs. And so I grabbed his guitar that was strategically positioned over his bed watching him day and night. Pull the guitar down and grab an amplifier, tune the guitar, and we decided to sing. And I wish, I wish I could just play those songs that we sang. And I just took my phone out and made sure to record those songs. And maybe there were five of us in the room. And boy, did we sing. And we sang, and we sounded like the old Chok Wawangya. <laughs> and we sang those songs. He enjoyed his favorite songs, but he made a request in addition to those that we sung. And I was a little shocked, but excited when I heard him say, do you know this song, Jesus, I'm coming someday? He said, yes, Pops, we know it. And we sang it. And we recorded it. Jesus, I'm coming someday. Jesus, I'm now on my way. Jesus, I gladly can say, we're Jesus and me to be there. While traveling here in this old world below, I want my life daily is goodness to show that I may be ready and waiting to go to sing in sweet heaven someday. Jesus, I'm coming someday. Jesus, what I feel on my inside, I'm now on my way. Jesus, without a shadow of a doubt, I gladly can say, with all I'm going through, Jesus, I 
I mean to be there in spite of everything. When we came down in September, he was much farther gone. His health in declination, and it was obvious that he didn't have long to stay. When I came that time, it took three days for him to recognize me and to call my name. I've gone into his room time and again and said, Pops, I'm here. He wasn't recognizing me then. On the third day, maybe I have some significance, right? I just thought of that. On the third day, after we came in, finally responded, and I asked him again, Pops, I'm here, you recognize me? The first time he looked up at me and he said nothing. And then he looked back down. And I asked him again and he looked up the second time. He was sitting. He looked up and he looked up in my eyes. And he said, he didn't say brother Beck, he said, said Beckford. I said, yes, Pops, it's me. And he said, good to have you around. And those were the last things he said to me. Saturday before he passed, my chaplain instinct clicked in. And I knew he was journeying. I told my wife and Angela, I need to have a one-on-one -on -one with him. I need to have a one-on-one -on -one with my father-in-law so I can talk to him. Because I knew he was struggling. I knew he wanted to go. But I knew also he was holding on for the rest of us. And I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one with him. I got my one-on-one -on -one with him about 6 o'clock the Saturday evening before he died. Sat by his bedside, laid over on, in, in his, looking on him, rubbing his head, and I kept telling him, I said, Father, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. By this time, he was too weak to talk audibly. I told him, I said, those songs you sung, the testimony you gave, the expectation you had, I said, Pops, Jesus' arms are open and he's waiting to welcome you. I said, you told him you're coming. You expect to be there and he's waiting for you. And I said, Pops, it's okay to go. It's okay to go. I said, we're going to be all right. I called his seven daughters' name. I said, every one of them, they're going to be all right. I said, Punch is going to be all right. We're going to be all right. I said, Pops, as a matter of fact, I just washed the house down. I washed it down all the way. It's like nice and clean. You would have been so proud to see it. I said, it's okay to go. Mama will be all right, and we all will be all right. We'll take care of things. The Lord is waiting for you, and you wanted to go. It's okay to go. He turned around. He turned around. He was at his side. He turned around. Full turn to me. And he was mumbling. He was mumbling. wanted to respond to me. But he didn't have the energy to speak. And I said, it's okay, Pops. I know you're weak. I know you can't be. But I, but I know where your heart is. And I left him. Actually, he turned back and he was falling asleep. And I thought, he fell asleep so there was no need to keep talking. About a hour and a half, I noticed my wife and Angela were in the room. And my wife was saying to me some of the same things that I was saying to him. But as I walked in the room, I walked in with my phone. I walked in with my phone and I said, I want to play these songs we recorded for him. And my wife said to me, maybe, maybe you shouldn't do it now. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do it now. And I turned the phone, the phone on and started to play. And as I got to the other side of the bed, he just turned full, full turn to me. Couldn't say a thing, but he heard the songs that we sang just a couple months ago. He heard those songs. And those were the last songs. Those were the last songs. My father listened to those were the last songs, the songs he requested. He heard those songs. Left, we left him. They got up the Sunday morning and they took care of him and they put him back to bed. Yeah. 
I mean, when they went back to look for him, when they went back to check on him, he was gone. Quietly, peacefully, just slept away. Just slept away. Hallelujah. 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 I must tell you, my friends, death as we call it as I wrap this up, death as we call it is not the end. It is a transition. It is a metamorphosis. It is a process of change. From mortality to immortality. From terrestrial to celestial. From church militant to church triumphant. From time to eternity. From pain and suffering to eternal joy and grace. That is not the end. Hallelujah. It's not the end. Hallelujah. That's why we do not grieve as two others. We grieve as those who have hope. Grieve as those who have hope. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, 21 to 24 says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is King. He said, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want. I don't know what's next for me. I am in a strait, he said. I am in a strait. And the word strait in the Greek means I am between. He said, I'm in between two. Means I'm in a strait. I'm in a narrow place. I have no flexibility. Somebody help me here. I feel like I'm in prison because I want to go, but you want me to stay. I'm in a strait. And he said, having a desire to depart. And to be with Christ, which is far better, far better than chemotherapy, far better, far better than, than the medication, far better than pain and suffering, far better. I want to be with him, but I understand I'm between two, because every one of you want to hold on to me. But I want to go. My mother-in-law told us that when they get every now and then he said, Mama, why is it taking so long? Why do I have to keep staying here? For me to live is Christ. And to die is not the end, it's a new beginning. Let me go. Let me go, I want to go. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. That's what Paul said. Not for me, for you. He answered his second call. Let me say as I conclude, my friends, every one of us in this life must answer to three calls. There are three major calls in life. The first one only is optional. Whether you're young or you're old, Rich or poor, smart or stupid, ignorant or arrogant, whether you're an, a self proclaimed atheist or an uncertain agnostic, there is a call we all must answer. The first one alone is optional. Call number one is a call to salvation. You have a choice to make when you get that call. Jesus said, if any man first, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. That's the first call. Some of us have chosen to answer that call. Some have rejected that call. And some even in this house are still rejecting that call. But you have an option for that call. You can choose whether you want to answer. The second call is a call to death. In Hebrews 9.27, the apostle says, It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. The word, and watch this, the word appointed. The word appointed means it is reserved and waiting. Are you with me here? It is appointed unto man once to die. Your death is reserved and waiting. You don't know when. We don't know who will make it to the burial place today. We don't know who's next. It is appointed unto man. 
The day you were born, my friends, and I'm trying to wrap it up here. The day you were born, you came up with a tag of expiration. Can I talk to somebody here? The day you were born, you had an expiration date on your birth. Not like a bottle of milk, but every now and then you can turn it and look. I was telling somebody the last funeral I went, I did in, 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 uh, in the Bronx. Not too long ago, I went to, I went to BJ's. And this lady was also fascinated with, with expiration date. <laughs> she was looking for expiration date on a, on a tree of heads. And I said, heads and expiration? Who, who look for expiration date? No, he did until it's done. <laughs> but she was so enamored with expiration date. And then she looked at mine and I never look for expiration date on him. I just buy it because I know it's soon done. <laughs> then she looked at my tray in my hand and said, see, she, she couldn't find it on her. She said, oh, you yours had expiration date. I said, really? Oh, yeah. So I, really? So I said, okay, so, so you can take mine since you want expiration date. <laughs> So I gave her mine and I took the one without expiration. I know they sue expire. Those heads will sue expire. Does your boil them two times, fry them two times, they expire. Who <laughs> <laughs> expiration did you want to hit the end? You're tired and labeled like a bottle of milk, my friend. But your appointment is set. You, I hear it this. It is appointed unto you to die. You didn't make the appointment. You don't know when the appointment is, and you can't change the appointment. Amen. You must keep it. And I, at time, I don't have time to go through it, but God knows I wish I had time. Yeah, but, but know that it did not say you make the appointment. And because you didn't make it, you don't know when it will be. Neither do you have access to the data or the date. And therefore, you can't make no adjustment. Can I sit this in there? Oh my God, we've gone long past time. But I heard that death came to one man's house. And he knew it was dead. And he knew that they'd have a list of people who's gonna kill today. And the man sneaking, when dead walked into his house and he treated him to give him a good bottle of drink so he can relax. <laughs> and while dead fell asleep, he looked at that dead list and saw that the next, the next, the next was him. That's why dead stopped there anyway. Because he knew he was next. And his name was at the top of the sheet, so he, while death fell asleep, he took his pen and he sneaked in and he moved his name from the top and put it at the bottom. Because he wanted to give himself some time. When that woke up, that said, you've been so good to me, man. Your name was at the top of my list. But because you've been so good, I'm going to start at the bottom. <laughs> I want you to use your imagination if he had anything left that wasn't wet. <laughs> oh Lord, if I had known, how would I make it stay at the top? The moral of that is, the moral is, you can't adjust your time when death comes. That's the moral. Amen. And the final call is the call to judgment. You have no option. Everyone in the grave shall hear his voice and shall answer to the deeds that they have done while dead, while, while the dash lasts. The only escape you have, my friends, my, 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 my nephews, my nieces, my in-laws, my friends, the only alternative you have is to choose to accept the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ that already pressured to pay the pardon for your sins. The only alternative is to answer the first call to secure your place in the second and to secure your place in the third. Can I talk to somebody here? You're going to answer them anyway. So you might as well make plans and prepare for them. We don't know if you're going to live as long as my father-in-law. Time may not last. The young are dying. The middle age are dying. Everybody is dying. Nobody knows when you have a label on.
then you won't have to worry about your sins coming behind you because you have accepted the free gift of salvation. It is not too late to do that today because Jesus used that word today. He never speaks of tomorrow. He never speak of past either because yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is a promise. Today is what you have. And so he said, today if you hear my voice, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. If you hear my voice, if you cry, if you call, I will come in and I will sup with you. If you open your door, I will come in and sit with you and you will be my child and I'll be your God forever. See by the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody give him a praise in here. Learn from my father-in-law. I have no shadow of a doubt. This good man that I love, that I love, that I love, that I love dearly. But he's gone home. He's left his testimony. He's left his deeds and his work behind him. And we can sing those songs in memory. Because memories don't leave like people do. Stand up with me. sing this last song. If you want us to pray with you, you can just raise your hand. You don't have to come. If you just want us to pray with you, if you want to, make, you want to secure your place in heaven, you got to begin at the beginning point, my friends. There is a hand down there. God bless you. There's another hand. some of the songs that we sung for Pops while we were there as we celebrate with him his special song. So enjoy these and remember him where his heart was.
Dear sinner, look up and have faith in the Lord. Believe and accept Him and abide in His word. For He is soon coming to give His reward to those who have faith. This world is not my home. I'm only passing by. My treasures and my home are all up in the sky. My friends and loved ones wait. Who tried this way before? And I can't feel at all in this world. Thank 
upon me from the heaven open, open, Lord, I can't feel it at all in this world anymore, and I can't feel at all in this world anymore. Peace to Pops and love to everyone. God bless you and I hope you find peace in him as well.